Case 14, another one of my faves. Go ahead. So you can see a massive uh, tumor, and from this perspective, you can see some of it is pretty pale. Yep. Um, go into a higher power, see these large histiocytes, so almost kind of this like granular appearance to them. And as we get closer, you can see these granules within the histiocytes. So this is good for a granular cell tumor. Yeah, so these look like histiocytes, right? But what kind of cells are these actually? What a granular cell tumor, what uh, what is its origin? Does anyone know? Schwann cells. Yeah, these are Schwann cells. This is actually, which is crazy, right? Because they don't look like Schwann cells. Uh, but these are actually, this is actually a nerve sheath tumor. It will stain with S100 and SOX10. It will also stain with CD68, which is a marker the histiocytes stain with, but it's not a specific histiocyte marker. CD68 is a marker that stains phagolysosomes. So, of course, histiocytes are abundant in phagolysosomes, but other cells can have them too. So any cell with a lot of phagolysosomes will probably label with CD68 immunostain. So I, you really don't need to do that stain in this case, but the classic teaching for a test is that this granular cell tumor is positive for S100 and also SOX10, by the way, and CD68. And also, if you do PAS, it will beautifully stain these granules. In real life, I mean, really, this is an H&E diagnosis. There is another form of non-neural granular cell tumor that looks kind of like this. I think it looks a little different, to be quite honest, but, but if you wanted to make sure it's not that, both are benign. Uh, there are very, very rare malignant versions of granular cell tumor, but they are, they are extremely rare. Um, so if you see something that's a granular cell tumor but has a lot of mitoses or pleomorphism, then you can go read up. There's some nice papers out there that talk about the criteria for that. But yeah, these, uh, these cells are, uh, look very similar to histiocytes and it could get confused with a xanthoma at, at first glance. But instead of them being bubbly, baculated cytoplasm, they have more like speckled, stippled, pink dots in the cytoplasm. Admittedly, that's a subtle kind of nuance difference. And then also they have these blobs, granular kind of globules in their cytoplasm. And those are called pustulo-ovoid bodies of milion, if you want to get real fancy and if you like eponyms. So try that out on your friends at your next cocktail party and see what happens. Um, that's what I like to say, at least. So uh, the cells have usually have round nuclei, uh, central punctate nucleoli, and usually low mitotic activity. They may have random pleomorphism. That's okay, just like for neurofibromas, schwannomas, other nerve sheath tumors. Nerve sheath tumors in general will have scattered degenerative type nuclear atypia, scattered pleomorphism, but with, with minimal mitoses or other features to concern you for malignancy. So just random pleomorphism is totally fine if that's the only thing that you have. And again, you can read up about the, the mitotic rate and the other things that can make you worry about an atypical or uncertain malignant potential granular cell tumor or a malignant one, but, but uh, the vast majority of these are, are totally benign, okay? The one other thing that I wanted to tell you, or two other things I wanted to tell you, wait, maybe three. Sorry, I keep thinking of more things as I say it. Okay, if it'll come back into focus here. This case doesn't have it, but a lot of times granular cell tumors produce a really striking pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia in the epidermis. So the epidermis can uh, grow down and look like a glassy, well-differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. So this is a particular problem in, and I feel like it's more common in mucosal sites. So the most, one of the most common places, I think actually the most common place for granular cell tumor is the tongue. So on the tongue, I feel like it's more often when I've seen granular cell tumors on the tongue, they often have the pseudoepithelialis hyperplasia. In the skin, I would say actually only a minority of the cases I've seen have it. So uh, this case doesn't have any, but just know that they can produce, uh, they can make, be a mimic of squamous cell carcinoma. And the key is if you think it's a glassy squamous cell carcinoma, look in the dermis or in the submucosa if you're in the, the mucosal site, in between the keratinocyte aggregates and look for granular cells there. I saw a case once on the bottom of the foot and it mimicked the wart. It make, made, a, instead of it looking like a squame, it looked like a veruca. The other thing is that at the periphery, granular cell tumor, even though this looks kind of circumscribed from low power, essentially always these have a feathery, almost quote, infiltrative border. And I don't like these word infiltrative because it sounds bad, but, but what the, uh, the cells 
kind of crawl between the dermal collagen, the reticular dermal collagen bundles. So they normally uh, intercalate with the collagen at the periphery and kind of trickle out at the edges and are not like uh, encapsulated or sharply circumscribed. And the third thing, and I can't show you, I don't know if this case has it, is it's very common to see gray nerve cell tumor growing around nerve bundles at the periphery. And that's because it's a nerve sheath tumor. So normally, uh, you know, we get worried when we see stuff grow around nerves, but it's totally normal for nerve sheath tumors to do that. And so uh, if you see that, don't be worried. It's like present in almost 90% of cases if you look around enough. So you don't need to find that, but just if you notice it, don't freak out. That's not bad. It's not a, not a worrisome finding.